Okay, let's check my sound. Do you hear me? I'm sorry. It's okay now. So, yeah. So, uh, thank you. So, dear participants of the International Youth Forum Bridge Plus Plus, uh, it's a great honor for me to be with you today and uh, share my experience of international youth projects development. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate, uh, congratulate Akil Mohammed and his team with such a success. And I'm absolutely happy uh, to observe this great outcome of our International Youth Forum on Public Diplomacy in TS we uh, launched last year. And today I'm going to share this experience with all the participants. Uh, today I'm going to answer and uh, to clarify four key aspects uh, of youth projects development that you see on the screen. Uh, we'll learn what a youth project on intercultural dialogue and public diplomacy is, how to develop and implement your project, and uh, what happens after the project. I'll share some useful tips uh, based on our NTS Youth Forum uh, experience. So let's start with the first question. What is a youth project on intercultural dialogue and public di diplomacy? Public diplomacy is defined as a system of dialogue with foreign audience. Uh, it is called uh, soft power or people's diplomacy. And uh, it's not just traveling or intercultural communication. Uh, it's an opportunity to represent your, uh, your country's interests. And uh, intercultural dialogue is an open and respectful exchange of views between individuals and groups belonging to different cultures that leads to a deeper understanding of others' global perception. And the uh, intercultural dialogue can be defined as uh, interpersonal, interpersonal communication as well, because each uh, person comes from different backgrounds. And uh, how to develop a project on intercultural dialogue and public diplomacy? Let's find out. Uh, first of all, you need to um, conduct the research. Secondly, uh, find the project team you feel very comfortable uh, work with. Then create a draft program. Find experts and participants. Implement your project. And finally, evaluate it. And let me uh, clarify each of these steps. Before you start, and if even uh, you have your own idea, it uh, doesn't mean that it's uh, very interesting for other people. Uh, so you can try to conduct a research and learn about society issues, target group request. What problems are really uh, important for all the stakeholders, government, uh, civil society, private sector, uh, youth, and even environment. environment. So um, when we talk about project teamwork, it means uh, that uh, you should find people who are able to uh, create a program which is relevant to all the issues you want to solve with help of your project. Uh, for example, here you can see a draft program of our InterGAS forum last year, and uh, you can use these for your future events. Then you, uh, you should find some um, budget for your project and the partners who can help you to implement it. Then make a very clear, uh, clear plan for all the members of your team. Then uh, let's talk about project implementation tips. First of all, you'll need to call for papers with some um, program, uh, start application process, 
invite lots of people, write lots of invitation letters, and uh, create info packs. And I would like to talk about info packs because it's very important for communication with all the participants of the event. For example, here you can see information pack of InterYes Inter Forum. And uh, if uh, your project is online, so please uh, put everything all the participants need during the, their work. Don't send lots of emails and uh, send them a very uh, clear information pack only once and then just uh, talk with them. Uh, or if your project is offline, uh, you can also put some information about the place, the space, the mills, or the dress code, and uh, try to think all the details to make your project a um, very, very high quality project. Yeah. Then choose a space where to conduct your project. If it's online, so choose an online project uh, platform. If it's online, um, visit different places in your city you are going to uh, organize your project with. And the in, uh, finally, evaluate your work and send also info packs uh, with all the information about your project. What happens after the project? And it's uh, it's a crucial question. Some of the organizers don't ask these questions always, yeah? So what happens? First of all, uh, try to collect all the feedback from experts and participants, uh, create evaluation Google Forms for all the um, stakeholders, <laughs> send lots of letters and emails, uh, it will help you to communicate with these people in the future and send final final info pack with links to project materials, uh, videos, photos, presentations, etc. Here you can see uh, our inf final um, information pack and uh, I would like to pay your attention to um, the links that insert uh, that were inserted into this information pack. Also try to use hashtags, uh, QR codes to make it more convenient for all the participants. I'm not going to cover some um, financial aspects of the project because uh, my colleagues are going to do this today, but I would like to um, share one key point that all the results and outcome, outcomes of your project should be displayed. What influence your project had? Try to answer these after the project and uh, decide what you should do in the future. And uh, for sure, the great outcome of your project can be um, a community you will develop during your project. Uh, so uh, you can provide them for an opportunity uh, with post maintains of the um, uh, work and uh, organize uh, joint events in the future. So I think it's a great result of your project if you are going to work with youth on international level. So thank you for, for your attention. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, much time to share lots of details with you, but you can contact me and find much more information visiting my uh, website. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Lubov, uh, very much for such an informative and interesting performance. I believe it was very helpful for our participants. I wish you lots of new bright ideas and beautiful projects in the future as well. Uh, so dear participants, if we have uh, time at the end of our sessions, uh, we can, you can ask our, our speakers the questions. Uh, and in the meantime, you can uh, write them down in the chat. chat. 
So uh, we continue to talk about how to successfully implement a project. And first of all, you need uh, to understand what resources will, the, uh, will support your project. The first question that arises in mind is where to get the money. Uh, nowadays, there are several organizations in the international space that support creative youth. Let me list just a few whom we work with. Many embassies of foreign countries provide financial support to projects aimed at promoting their culture and language. There are also such funds as the Presidential Grants Foundation, a branch of this grant competition existing since this year, the Presidential Fund for Cultural Initiatives, Rossatrudnicestva, Ruski Mir Foundation, this is if we are talking about promoting the image of Russia abroad, the Federal Agency for Youth Affairs, Rosmaladios, which provides grants to individuals, as well as our wonderful partner and friend, the Alexander Gorchakov Public Diplomacy Fund, about whose activities Sandra Stoilkovich, specialist and project manager of the Alexander Gorchakov Public Diplomacy Fund, will kindly tell us. Dear Sandra, please take the floor. Uh, dear Sandra, please check your internet connection because uh, it's not very clear. Yeah, maybe you should uh, turn your video off. Okay, there are some technical problems uh, and um, uh, we will wait for Sandra to check her connection. So now uh, I would like to move on and uh, to tell you that this year People's Friendship University of Russia chairs the BRICS Network University which is an educational project aimed at developing preferentially bilateral and multilateral short-term joining training, master's and PhD programs, along with joint research projects in various knowledge fields. And today we have Angelina Osipova, head of the organizational and financial support of international projects and cooperation with Network Universities of People, People's Friendship University of Russia. And she will tell us a little about BRICS Network University, about its main results of 2020-2021 and development prospects, prospects. I guess it will be interesting to our participants. So Angelina, the floor is yours. Yes, let me uh, make my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Can you listen to me? Ah, oh, I'm okay. Okay, uh, so first of all, I want to say good day to all the colleagues, all the members of International Youth Forum BRICS Plus. 
Uh, I'm pleased to welcome all of you and very grateful to you for meeting here today in the online format, uh, despite the distance and various time zones in order to take part in the meeting of our International Youth Forum BRICS Plus. Uh, today, more than ever, cooperation and mutual assistance of BRICS partner states are important to support and develop cooperation. For this purpose, it's necessary to rely on the existing experience and projects in educational cooperation, and one of which is BRICS Network University. Oh, okay. Uh, the idea of BRICS Network University was suggested by the Russian party at the meeting of the ministers of education of the BRICS uh, member states. And during Russia's presidency in BRICS 2015, the ministers of education uh, signed the memorandum of understanding on establishment of BRICS Network University. Uh, this, uh, at present, BRICS Network University com comprises nine universities from Brazil, 12 from Russia, 12 from India, uh, 11 from China, and 20 from the Republic of South Africa. In, in total, the consortium consists of uh, 56 leading universities from five BRICS member states. Uh, the universities were selected by the National Ministers of Education in uh, accordance with six priority fields of study of BRICS Network University. Uh, the memorandum provides for BRICS Network University activities in the following six priority fields of study. It's like energy, computer science and information security, BRICS studies, ecology and climate change, water resources and pollution treatment, and economic. Um, also, the universities uh, interact in these fields of study within the framework of the international thematic groups. And uh, the BRICS Network, in, uh, Network University International Thematic Groups uh, established in line with the BRICS Network University knowledge uh, field priorities. I, mm, I will not repeat it. Uh, it's like the same like uh, field of studies. BRICS Network University follows uh, such principles as openness, uh, focus on educational programs that uh, can be supplemented by the network research and innovation projects, equal rights of all participants. So it means that uh, BRICS Network University participants independent from each other and relate uh, to each other equip equals. Uh, reciprocity in treatment of all participants involved in joint activities, assurance of high quality of the BRICS Network University educational programs, uh, ensure it through close connection with the research and innovation active. Research for the national uh, regulations, procedures and practice of each country. The main activities of the BRICS Network University, um, I will also uh, tell, it's like offering in the conformity with own laws, master and PhD programs, short term training and modular courses development and implementation of joint research projects, innovative activity within the frames of educational programs, and organization of the academic mobility of students, the university faculty and staff of the BRICS Network University participants. Um, also, uh, BRICS Network University graduates reserve. I will uh, tell it's the first one is diploma of the national university. It's like in the university of his country in which the student takes compulsory courses and elective courses. And uh, the, at the basic university of one of the country's participants, the student takes only elective courses. So, and the uh, mm, second one type is uh, two documents of on higher education of partner universities. Uh, next, I want to say that in 2020, within the uh, Russian presidency in BRICS, 
Uh, the Russian party conducted uh, the following events within the framework of um, BRICS Network University, university activities. So um, uh, it was like two meetings of BRICS National Coordinating Committee, BRICS Network University meetings of the BRICS Network University International Thematic Groups, International Governing Board of BRICS Network University, Senior Educational Officials Meter, and meeting of BRICS Ministers of Education. Uh, and also, uh, during these meetings, there was uh, documents which provided the directions and laid down the concrete steps on the further cooperation uh, and were presented uh, at uh, International Governing Board. So the first one is concept of BRICS Network University and roadmap. Uh, BRICS, uh, conce the concept of BRICS Network University lays down the main goals of BRICS Network University and focus areas and the main stages of the BRICS Network University. Uh, so the first one is uh, introductory stage. Second one is formation stage. Like at this, uh, at present, we are at this very stage. Testing and implementation stage and um, a stage of a full-fledged work format uh, started from uh, 2026. Uh, the next one uh, important document is uh, the BRICS Network University Roadmap for short and uh, medium term. It consists of three sections. The first one is organizational and legal support. Uh, second section is academic and scientific support. And um, the last one is conference meetings and festivals. Also, I want to say that in 2022, uh, the Russian National Coordin Coordination Committee uh, has done a great deal of work under the implementation of BRICS Network University Roadmap. So uh, the following documents have been developed like uh, draft concept of uh, students' academic mobility, teaching staff academic mo mobility, catalog of the programs uh, through in English, and uh, proposals for the formation and development of BRICS uh, uh, BRICS uh, scientific journal. And um, another important thing, I would like to like highlight this uh, stable funding is uh, vital for the successful um, implementation of joint educational program. For this purpose, the government of uh, the Russian Federation has been allocating quotas for study at BRICS Network University for many years. In 2022, the Ministry of Education and Science of the Russian Federation allocated uh, uh, 60 um, quotas for students of foreign uh, universities to study in Russia within BRICS Network University. Unfortunately, I'm sure the current epidemiolo epidemiological situation did not allow to enroll all the students in BRICS Network University, but uh, in this year, um, just uh, eight students from China and one student from Brazil can come and study in Russia uh, within BRICS Network University. I think it's a good uh, opportunity for students to study for free in uh, all the uh, Russian universities and in our University Ruden and in all in other universities of Russia with the members of BRICS Network Universities. Uh, so here I finish my uh, speech. If you have any questions, I, with my big pleasure, can answer. So thank you, colleagues. Uh, there is a question in chat for you.
Uh, sorry for the issue. Uh, Kira, can you please uh, rename yourself? And Angelina, there is a, uh, a question for you. Uh, hello. Uh, okay. I am looking for an integrate another university into this. Who can I contact? Uh, there's a question in chat for you. Uh, I, I will I will text here in chat uh, the, my email. And if you have any questions about uh, study in Russia or in our university, I mean, in within the BRICS Network University, you can contact me and I will answer to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina. Uh, well, this is a very large scale project. We will all be waiting for the last development stage of the BRICS Network University when it's going to work at full strength. Thank you. Uh, so we move uh, on to Sandra. Sandra, are you here? Sandra? Not yet. Okay. Uh, Sandra let's go is here to. And you need to open her uh, audio. Just one second. Okay. Okay. So a few words uh, before Sandra is connecting. Uh, we continue to talk about how to successfully implement a project. And first of all, uh, I, I already said that you get, need the money. So um, Sandra will uh, talk about how to implement a project and how to uh, get a grant from Alexander Gorchakov Public Diplomacy Fund. So is she here already? Just a minute. Uh, he is okay. opening uh, <laughs> uh, audio. Uh, it happens. Name is written in Russian. That's why he, a technical person is not able to <laughs> find. Oh, yeah. Now, now she can open. Hello. Hello. Can so you please, everything for, fine? The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Kira was saying, uh, you need the money to realize your project. So uh, I'm glad to present uh, today uh, the Alexander Gorchakov uh, Public Diplomacy Fund. Uh, let me make a short presentation of uh, what uh, our fund presents. Uh, I hope it's, uh, I will share my, share my screen. I hope uh, you can, uh, can you please, the organizers, can you let me demonstrate my, share my screen? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can everyone see it? Is everything fine? Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, we were named uh, named after Alexander Mikhailovich Gorchukov. Uh, one of our favorite uh, Sayings of his is uh, that Russia is uh, accused of isolating herself and keeping silent when faced with facts that are neither in harmony with the law nor with justice. They say that Russia is talking, Russia is not talking, she is composing herself. So this is probably one of the strongest saying uh, in our fund and we like it since uh, uh, due to contemporary events, um, a lot of uh, people foreigners uh, abroad uh, think that uh, Russia is isolating because uh, she thinks she's doing something wrong, but uh, getting to the point, it's not that uh, we're doing something wrong. I think that Russia is heading actually uh, in the right way and it's on the right path. And uh, by the way, not only on the right path, but making uh, friends uh, and uh, um, working on developing uh, different spheres of cooperation with different countries, including the countries of the BRICS. So I'm happy to be here today and uh, present my fund. Uh, so um, our fund was established in accordance with the decree of the president of the Russian Federation in February, 2010. And uh, its uh, institutor is uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. Uh, on this slide, so you can see the fund structures. Uh, 
uh, we have uh, the Board of Trustees, which is headed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. Lavrov. And uh, the other people you see on the screen are our uh, trustees. Uh, they are constantly with us and we're lucky to have them and have their support. Um, I, then we have the management board advisory and the academic board. Uh, the management board uh, is uh, headed by our executive, as the executive director, uh, Mr. Leonid Drachevsky. Uh, and we have the advisory board headed by uh, Igor Ivanov, the president of Russian International Affairs uh, Council, uh, which actually assess the quality of uh, implementation of uh, scientific, educational and uh, public initiative supported by the fund. And then we have the academic board, uh, which is headed by Anatoly Turkunov, director of uh, Magima University, uh, which uh, ensures the formation of priority areas of research and educational initiatives. Uh, on our next slides, uh, you can see our main partners. Uh, we hope to uh, spread this list, uh, although not ev every partner of ours is uh, here. This is uh, a list of our most constant partners. Uh, so we have the Magimo University, we have Diplomatic Academy, we have Rosa Trudniches for Rosmoadjoz, we have the IMEMO, we have different institutes, and we are very happy to have their part, have them as their as our partners, and have them here have their support in organizing different events, especially those uh, that are organized abroad. Um, next slide uh, speaks about the uh, forms of work of the Gorchakov Fund. Uh, so we have uh, our individual events. Uh, we compose them. Uh, we search for partners uh, in Russia and abroad, uh, dealing with the topic that we would like to uh, do a research on or that we would like to conduct a conference on. Uh, and uh, we connect, as uh, in the previous presentation, I liked, I liked very much uh, where they said, where they explained uh, about uh, how organization is done uh, when holding an event especially with uh, writing letters, uh, having an official addressing, and uh, uh, of course, uh, searching for support, not only from university, not only by attracting students, uh, not only by uh, attracting maybe some business structures that will be able to uh, maybe financially support your event and uh, be your partner, and uh, maybe open the doors of which you maybe have never imagined to. Uh, next of our forms of work is uh, grant support for NGOs. Uh, actually, the Gorchako Fund is the only organization in Russia that supports, gives grants to uh, foreign NGOs. So uh, in case you have some uh, projects you would like to realize, uh, we would be more than uh, happy to have your application uh, revised. Uh, you can check, for example, um, I... Um, listened uh, in the previous presentation about the organizations uh, that give support in Russia. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, turn to Russian organiza organizations uh, dealing with the issues uh, your organization is elaborating on because uh, having a strong, strong support in Russia is actually uh, very nice, something nice to have. Uh, besides uh, us giving grant support to foreign NGOs, uh, actually, if you have a Russian one as a partner, uh, then they can apply to the presidential grant, they can apply for the grants uh, in Rosmodios, Rostatrudnicestva, etc., etc. So it would be nice to have a partner in Russia. Um, in uh, speaking about the grant support, uh, again, uh, I have to underline that uh, we give grants financial support only to uh, non-profitable organization and non-governmental organizations uh, working in the field of international relations in the media. Uh, so if in case your organization as it's uh, written uh, a bit below scientific research center, if it's an NGO, then uh, we are happy to uh, have your application. But if, it's, uh, if it is a state structure, if it's something profitable, unfortunately we, could not support it. We 
we we are not able because uh, according to our status, uh, uh, we only support uh, non profitable and non governmental organizations. Uh, in case you would like to implement projects in the fields, as uh, written in this slide. International Scientific Expert Cooperation, uh, the cooperation with domestic and foreign media, interregional cooperation, youth projects as this one uh, in public diplomacy and regional public diplomacy initiatives. Uh, then um, von Garchakov is uh, the fund that you should address to. How to receive a grant? The most common question. Uh, we have. Um, a special section on our website. You can visit it, gorchakofan.ru. Uh, you open it. You can uh, uh, make an account. Uh, you log in, uh, and uh, you wait for uh, official publication of uh, the grand contest opening. Uh, we have uh, two contests uh, during the year. One is in winter, from the 15th January till the 15th February. And the second one is in summer from the 15th of uh, July till the 15th of uh, August. Uh, as soon as you log in, you can feel free to explore our website, explore our uh, um, field of uh, grant. And uh, in case you have a question, as soon as we open the contest, so we have uh, uh, people working constantly on the, our emails, uh, constantly working in the system, and uh, in case you have uh, not only technical questions, but also maybe looking for some advice, uh, then we have specialists in the fund that deal with the questions you your organization deals with. For example, I am the head of uh, the Balkans. So uh, Balkan program, so uh, in case you, we have some Balkanists here, I'm glad to Welcome everyone, and uh, we'll be glad also to see your application, not only as participant, but also uh, as an uh, organization that applies for grant. Uh, again, based on an independent evaluation, don't think that uh, something is set up or anything. It's uh, actually the system uh, of evaluation is uh, quite long because we have uh, different boards. Uh, giving their advices, giving their opinion about it, giving their uh, uh, not only scientific but professional uh, opinion, and uh, we which we actually value. And uh, upon uh, mutual agreement, uh, there are uh, around 15 to 20 organizations, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, it depends on the quality of the application. Then the uh, you, you receive a letter or with positive or uh, negative answer, but uh, we're happy to, in case you haven't managed to um, apply on time or maybe uh, your application didn't technically suit uh, the program, then uh, feel free to address uh, us, uh, to contact us next time. We'll be glad to help you. Um, on the next slide, you can see some of the examples of the organization we more or less constantly work uh, in the framework, not only with grants, but uh, in cooperation with uh, our own programs. Uh, one of them is uh, the Russian Armenian Youth Unity. Uh, they uh, usually um, held, held, held cold events uh, regarding uh, cooperation of Russia with Armenia, Russia with the Caucasus, Russia with the uh, Commonwealth countries. Uh, then we have uh, uh, some British events uh, held by the Youth Coordinating Council of Russian Compatriots of Great Britain. Uh, then we have events uh, regarding uh, non-proliferation, non nuclear energy disarmament, uh, et cetera, by the think tank Center for Energy and Security Studies. And uh, the last example is uh, uh, an example of uh, event uh, held upon uh, digital technology and science diplomacy held uh, by the Project Office for Digital Development of Samara uh, region, uh, which was actually their uh, second or third event uh, uh, this year, I think uh, maybe it was held, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, last week. 
Uh, so if you follow for the news on our uh, website, uh, not only websites, uh, later I'll show we have Twitter, we have YouTube, uh, we have uh, Telegram, we have uh, all the possible uh, networks that we're on and uh, you can follow us on which uh, suits you uh, most. Uh, regarding our annual events of the fund, uh, we have, uh, again, uh, various uh, courses, uh, various um, projects. Uh, we have, for example, Diplomatic Seminar of Young Specialists from all around the world, uh, people studying diplomacy, diplomatic academy, and not only uh, apply and uh, are invited to participate uh, two times per year at uh, this diplomatic uh, seminar event. Uh, then we have the Caucasus Dialogue, the, we have the Balkan Dialogues, so which I coordinate, and we have, uh, as an example, Dialogue in the Name of the Future, which is uh, one of the strongest events of our fund. This is usually held uh, in the end of the year, and uh, Probably the most interesting for our participants is uh, meeting uh, Mr. Lavrov uh, personally in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, having a close meeting uh, with uh, a discussion, open discussion with uh, young leaders uh, being there at place. So we have, for example, a school of uh, Central Asia, which is currently uh, held uh, in Tashkent. Today is uh, their first day. Uh, so uh, if they're in touch with us, listening to us, I would like to greet them as well and to wish them a successful work as uh, we are doing now at uh, this Forum BRICS. Uh, and then we have other media schools, uh, Youth Primakov readings, uh, Potsdam meetings, etc., etc. So if you follow us, not only by the grant um, uh, direction uh, you can follow us and uh, apply for different events uh, regarding our personal uh, events uh, so you uh, follow you uh, by the way you can also log in and you can uh, if it's difficult for you to follow for example uh, uh, our website so we have a weekly digest uh, you can log in you can apply that you get this digest weekly and uh, follow for the news, maybe something interesting, interesting will come up uh, and you'll apply. We also have different projects uh, regarding BRICS, uh, not that much, but thanks to Akil, I think that we will be able to uh, spread our field of interest and maybe spread uh, the, on the territories that we uh, less work. Hopefully the offline event, as Akil mentioned, will be held in uh, New Delhi, India, and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to participate. Uh, by, the way, uh, by the way, we uh, also, as it was mentioned, uh, hold an event for uh, uh, grant uh, for financial support, for uh, receiving financial support. We open contests for uh, individual foreign persons um on uh, eurasia global a forum held uh, yearly uh, in uh, orenburg this year in orenburg last year as well uh, and uh, akil is uh, one of the persons that got uh, his financial support and uh, hopefully in new delhi we will see each other uh, and uh, maybe have this event uh, wider uh, we have uh, also Gorchakov Club. Uh, this is an informal union of alumni and partner partners. Uh, this is um, approximately how uh, the statistics show uh, with the uh, organization from which regions uh, we usually cooperate, from uh, which uh, parts of the world we have partners. Uh, and uh, with the organization and the people that we mostly work, uh, we invite them to be a part of this club. And uh, each year uh, we have also closed meetings uh, and uh, we provide them a special program, which is uh, quite unique. And I hope that uh, our partners uh, would be more than glad to join us. Uh, we also have uh, One minute. case. Okay. I'll be short. We also have uh, some the programs as uh, expert um, mobile support and Russian view. 
It means that uh, in case you uh, want to participate as an expert uh, in some event, you are invited, but you don't have uh, the financial support. Uh, we will be able to uh, review your application and uh, possibly provide you with the possibility to, for example, if you are in India and you would like to come to Russia or and you're dealing with uh, Russian, Indian, uh, Russian, Chinese, Russia, BRICS, uh, um, as this event or maybe wider, um, I'm not limiting anyone, so please, uh, uh, you can contact us, so we are open for communication. Uh, we have uh, Primakov Russian uh, Public Center in Tbilisi. Uh, since we have um, uh, a quite spe specific relations uh, Georgian-Russian, I think that uh, also following uh, this kind of news of this center, how it works and uh, the accents it makes uh, in the uh, field of research and cooperation. I think it's uh, worth seeing it. Um, I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. For your attention. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, and special thanks to Gorchakov Fund for the financial support of this forum. Let's hope that things get better and we will be able to hold it in 2020 in India, New Delhi offline which is for sure is uh, much more, uh, a much more effective and interesting format. Uh, so there are some questions in the chat for you, but uh, we need to move on because we are already a little bit out of schedule. So um, we move on to develop the topic of grant support for projects. Uh, certainly each of the BRICS countries also has grant competitions, and I'm glad to present Vitoli Siyodi, Manager of Public and International Relations of National Youth Development Agency of South Africa, who will kindly tell us about funding opportunities of National Youth De uh, Development Agency for South African youth projects. Vitoli, are you here? Yes, good morning. I mean, good, good afternoon. I'm not sure Hi. if you can see me. Hi. Yes. Um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you are network. a little bit dark. <laughs> Is a it the, dark. maybe um, maybe in front of the yeah maybe maybe in front of the window if you yeah that's that's okay I think. That's, that's okay. All right. All right. Thank that's you. Okay. My network okay. is not that um, that good, so allow me to switch off the video so that at least we don't have to break. Um, let me switch off the video, then we can be able to dim. Not sure if you can see my presentation. Not yet. Not yet. All right, otherwise, let me not waste time um, with, with, with that. Um, let me just uh, proceed. Um, Can you just double click the NYD... this file of presentation? We can see your screen, just you need to open the file. Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to do that. My um, it's jammed. Right. Can you see it now? Nope. No. Okay. All right. Let's 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 just proceed so that I don't take time. If possible, can you send uh, uh, the file in chat so that uh, we can uh, open it or uh, people can use it from there and you can start with that. All right, I'll, do, maybe, that. I'll do that. I'm mindful of maybe the time. Maybe you could send so it to me. Yeah. yeah. I'm mindful of the time. I'm sending it to you. I 
right, I've done that on the Brix Plus email. Right, in the meantime, can I proceed? Yeah, sure. All right, thank you. Let me just give you give you a background a bit while we're we are, we are getting that on the National Youth Development Agency. We are a South African-based agency established primarily to tackle um, uh, challenges that um, our country is facing, that our country's youth are faced with. We were established by an act of parliament um, in 2008, and we were established to be a single unitary structure established to address youth development issues at national, provincial, and local government level. The existence of NYDA should be also be located within the broad context of South Africa's development dynamics. We, like many developing countries, uh, South Africa has got a large population of youth, those between the ages of 13, uh, 14 and 35 percent, um, I mean 13 and 35 um, um, of age represent uh, 42 percent of our total population. The NYDA also plays a leading role in ensuring that all major stakeholders, such as government, private sector, civil society, prioritize youth development and contribute towards identifying and implementing long-lasting solutions that address youth development challenges. Furthermore, we... Furthermore, we... we the NYDA designs and implements programs that are aimed at... Um, um, improving the lives of young people as well as availing opportunities to young people. Uh, in summary, these uh, programs that we're talking about on an individual level, the NYDA provides direct services to youth in the form of information provision, career guidance services, mentorship, skills development and training, entrepreneurial development and support, health awareness programs, and also involvement in, in, in sports. In the community level, the NYD encourages young people to be catalysts for changing their own communities through involvement in community development activities, social cohesion initiatives, national youth service programs and social dialogues, and at provincial and national level, um, uh, through our policy development and partnerships and research programs, the NYD facilitates the participation of youth development in key policy inputs, which shape the socioeconomic development uh, landscape of our, of our country. Um, just in terms of our of our of our of our strategy, just in terms of our 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 our, our strategy, um, we are guided by the following principles: economic development through youth entrepreneurship, decent employment through uh, through job uh, jo the, our jobs program, uh, social cohesion and pathway for economic emancipation through coordination of national youth service, and also providing universal access to for vulnerable youth and of course, uh, research for, that informs the work that we do. Um, just getting into what, we've been, what I've been called here to talk about, um, just to share in terms of, of funding that is available within NYDA for what kind of programs. We've, um, maybe let me start also by who, in terms of the criteria qualifies for our programs, uh, our economic development programs. You have to be between the ages of 13 to 35 years at the time of when you are applying for our programs. And then you, there has to be at least a potential skill appropriate for the enterprise that they, are, that they conduct or intend to conduct. So when you want to start a business and you want to apply for funding from us, so you should at least show us that you've got, you, you've got a, 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 um, the skill to do the kind of business that you want to do, or at least or the business that you want to start. And also you have to be a South African citizen. You have to be within the borders of South Africa. And then you are also involved in the day-to-day -day running uh, uh, operation and management of the, of the business. And then you also have to either operate the business informally or formally or generally recognized as a micro enterprise. Um, you can be a street trader, you can be a vendor, you can be uh, an emerging enterprise. And then members of the entities should comprise um, hundred percent South African citizens, and and business uh, the business should also be operating within the borders of South Africa. But that, where in terms of assessment, can be looked into because there are those that are doing import and exports. The kind of product and services that we we, we provide, the the support that we provide to small, medium, and uh, micro enterprises, 
at different business development stages that we provide. It could be a pre-startup, it could be a startup or a survivalist business that is a registered business or a PTY or a corporation um, has just commenced business operations and it's just not reached the, uh, the break point, even point. You could be also in the early development stages of your business, or you could be also wanting to grow and expand your, your business. Um, we have developed a grant uh, program, as I've already indicated, and uh, with the grant program, we don't just provide the grant program, but the grant program is accompanied by a variety of services, and such services include uh, the voucher program that I will talk about at a later stage, the training program also that I will talk about at a later stage, and also the business advisor program that we'll talk about at a later, at a later, at a later stage. Uh, if you can go back to the previous slide. All right. This uh, one? Go, for that. go to the Further? next one. Go this to one? the next one. Uh, go to the next one. Continue. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, continue. Yeah, on, the, on this, yeah, on, on this one. Thank you. This? Okay. Not the previous one? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. You can go back, go back, go back, go back. The previous one? The previous one. This one? Yes, this one. So I was saying, okay, okay thank you. Um. I was saying that we. I, I, will, I was. I was saying that we'll talk about the training programs, and then we'll also talk about the business advisor programs. Uh, that includes mentorship program and market linkages program. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I want to talk much more about the the grant program. The objective here is to provide young entrepreneurs an opportunity um, to uh, access financial support. Uh, to establish and improve their businesses. Uh, the program focus on youth entrepreneurs who are just coming to, into existence and beginning to, uh, uh, to start um, their businesses. Um, the process, how it works is that one would work, go to our um, branch. Right now we've developed an, an um, um, ERP program as an online program where you can go to our website and uh, apply from there instead of just uh, only going to our, our, our branch. But then we'll do an inquiry. And then once we get an inquiry, we'll do an assessment. Once we've done an assessment, we'll look where, we'll check whether that person needs a business management training. If they need business management training, then we'll re refer them to the business management training. And if they don't, because the others are already have degrees or post uh, metric qualifications in terms of business management, they, didn't, uh, they do not need to go through, through the business management training. And then we'll start the grant application. We'll then do the due diligence and then approval stage. And then we'll do the contracting and then the disbursement. And then after that, and then we'll provide the aftercare. We've got a, a, a threshold. Threshold one, it's 1,000 to 10,000. Um, this business would be a business that employs at least one person. 10,000 to 50,000, it would be a business that employs at least two people. 50,000 to 100,000, it would be a business that employs at least um, uh, two, more than two people. Uh, and then uh, for uh, the last threshold is uh, from 100,000 to 200,000, that would be at least be employing at least more than uh, five, people, uh, five, five people. And then for cooperatives, uh, we are able to fund cooperatives up to 250,000, but they must be willing to employ up to at least uh, five people. You can go to the next slide. The um, what would we use the grant for? The grant program and um, uh, the utilization of the grant can be used for uh, plant equipment, machinery, office equipment, uh, computer equipment. Uh, it could be shop fittings. It could be uh, furniture. But then, um, in terms of the assessment, when the assessment is done, that is when then they would be able to see what exactly do you need. Let me also say that we don't provide a cash uh, in terms of money. And when you apply for the grant, when you, once the, 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 the business has been um, um, assessed, we will look into what you need. If you need a, a machinery, then we'll go and buy a machinery for you. So that um, uh, then, then we do that instead of giving cash, because uh, when we give cash, people don't do what they 
are supposed to do with the cash. So we changed the policy, and then now we, we only uh, provide we buy the equipment that is required by the by the business. In exceptions, uh, we can be able to give if we've approved an example as, as an example fifty thousand. We can give about uh, ten percent of that money uh, for uh, um, some of the few things that the business need to use in terms of uh, cash, but we don't necessarily provide cash. Uh, exclusions include partial funding or co-funding or funding towards a deposit for a loan. So you can take a loan from somewhere and say that then we provide you a grant uh, to, to pay the loan. Or maybe then you are in the business of gambling or gaming involving a, a chance at uh, 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 sex industries or operating other activities that are not in line with the um, uh, laws of our country. T tobacco and alcohol as a prim primary income generator. Uh, this one, it's, uh, we know that when you run a, a restaurant, the restaurant might need uh, to have uh, tobacco or alcohol, but then that should not be the primary income generation of the, of the, of the business. Or then you require finance to substitute an existing financier. So you took a, um, a, a loan from somewhere and then you require finance for us then to be able to solve the other challenges that you might have encountered with the other, with the other uh, financier. So we don't do that. Or where the owner or the applicant is attending a school other than tertiary. So if you are still in basic education, we are unable then to fund. We only fund from those that are already in tertiary education uh, or not in school. You can go to the next slide. So I was saying that we we the, the grant funding doesn't come only uh, as, as a grant funding. So it's accompanied by a variety of services that we provide. So as I've already indicated, we'll do the identification of the most deserving entrepreneurs. And then we'll do the business development support. So this would be young people through training, business development skills, uh, acquisition, networking, mentoring, and coaching. And then from there, then, then we'll uh, provide the grant to our most deserving, um, to our most deserving, uh, those that deserve the grant more than, uh, and, uh, than anybody else. And then once we've provided the grant, we'll also then do a, what is called aftercare. Aftercare, we provide it for a period of two years. So in this period of two years, we'll do monitoring and evaluation whether to see how the business is growing. And then we'll also then continue to provide uh, a business support um, so that we make sure that we don't just uh, provide the grant and then leave you like that, but we'll also provide uh, services to make sure that um, the business does uh, grow and provide you with the necessary support that is required for the business to be able to, to grow. You can go to the next slide. Um, then we do quality. We'll then do. Um, let's 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 keep this. This one is the uh, around the, the voucher program that I've already sp spoke about. I'm trying to save time because we've got uh, about uh, 10, 10 minutes. And then this is also the training program that we we, we have spoken about. We'll do an application process. We'll do, provide the training. And then we'll then do the post training aftercare and quality assurance. And then we'll also do record keeping. You can go proceed. You can proceed the next slide. Okay, let me let, let me proceed. I think there's a technical challenge there. The what we would will, will also do is that would we'll provide the training as I've, I've already indicated, and then lastly, what we'll then do is to other services that we'll provide is that we'll do we'll also do business development plan we also do entrepreneurship development training we also do business development support we also do mentorship support we also do market linkages one of the things that i saw in one of the communications as we were communicating was that what what are also the gaps one of the critical elements of what we've seen in what in terms of our experience and in terms of the research that we're doing with those that we work with is that one of the critical elements that is a gray area uh, that is the need is market linkages. So you find that there is a business, but this business cannot access markets. So we do provide such kind of a service where we link business with potential uh, market and we call that uh, 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 service market linkage, uh, um, uh, market linkages. And we also provide mentorship support 
report, as I've already indicated. And um, as I work towards conclusion, um, one of the things that are drivers for entrepreneurship in our country is that you have to have access to capital, and which is that something that is a, a bit of a challenge for other young people. Uh, but from NYDA, that is why we came up with a grant program, because the grant program, you don't have to pay it back. Uh, so that those that are starting, those are that are, are survivalists, those are that are informal businesses, they can be able to access funding so that they can be able to start at least. And then secondly, we One do minute. the process of market access to market and then also uh, development uh, uh, programs. So I think in a nutshell, that is what we do maybe in conclusion in the 30 seconds that I'm left with. We also previously had partnerships with the Industrial Development Corporation, a small enterprise develop, um, um, a finance agency, and other finance, financial institutions that from the grant program, once you have graduated from the, from the grant program, then we can refer you to those that you can get more than 200,000 or more than 250,000, you can get up to 5 million, up to 10 million, depending on how your business is. Uh, let me pause there, and then if there are questions, then we'll be able to take them, thank you. Well, thank you, Tolly. That was really interesting in, uh, to know how, to, how the youth projects are supported in the South Africa. Um, thank you for your comprehensive presentation. And uh, now we are going to be very fast. Yekaterina Titushkina, Program Coordinator of European Youth Association. Um, she will tell us uh, what young people should pay attention to when presenting a project, its main components and opportunities for obtaining financial support for a project or startup. Ekaterina, please, uh, the floor is yours. And please, dear speakers, don't um, forget that uh, you have 10 minutes for your speech. Okay, hello, thank you. Even less now. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, so, uh, today we are talking about uh, how many opportunities uh, uh, young people have to uh, to get money uh, for the project. But uh, I have repeatedly presented projects and conducted experts to call their project at different levels. Uh, today I will tell you about the main components that the presentation should consist of. I want to note right away that uh, depending on the purpose of the presentation, uh, new companies will be added. Uh, let's start with the slide structure. We have uh, cover, problem slides, uh, solution slides, product, uh, competitive advantages, team, and uh, financials. Um, all right, the so problem slide. Uh, this is one of my favorite problem slides ever. Uh, three clear, direct, and uh, uh, indisputable statements uh, writing a problem slide uh, is a common challenge. A founder is very familiar with the uh, status quo and to uh, overcrowd the slide with uh, access industry details. And the other examples, uh, it's a charity water, uh, how this fund shows uh, why water is so important and how many people in the world live without uh, clean water. Uh, they reveal the program uh, through numbers and through four important components, health, education, time, women empowerment. Uh, remember, I uh, think of uh, undebatable statements. Now the problem stated on the slide need to be tackled on the next slide uh, of the solution. Uh, this is a good example of a uh, solution of Airbnb company. On the slide, uh, they focus on answering the problem with, uh, the, uh, with three statements, save money, make money, and share culture. Once again, notice how simple the headline is, uh, a web platform where users can rent their space to host travelers. And the other example is uh, uh, charity water. Uh, and uh, they show how every dollar uh, in invested can help solve the problem. So simple, explaining what your, uh, your project uh, does in 10 words or less is by no means an easy task. 
for example, uh, when your grandmother asks you what you what you do, and you can answer in a simple sentence. Uh, the next slide is a uh, product. Uh, uh, the product is not a lot of ad here. Uh, you need to, in any case, you need to show your product. It can be a website or some kind of um, items. Uh, the next slide is uh, competitive advantage. Uh, the purpose of any presentation is to interest the donor. Uh, how we can do this uh, is to highlight uniqueness. What you have uh, that others don't have, for example, uh, the difference of your project from similar ones. Uh, the first, uh, the third, the first in uh, the region, in uh, your country, in the world, for example. Uh, a good example of uh, Airbnb would be uh, the first, uh, the number one, they, are, they were the first to market, and number two, they provided uh, incentive uh, for, for the host. Uh, also, one of one of important slides is slide uh, the team. Uh, not a lot uh, to add on the team slides. Uh, make sure you only talk about core uh, core team members, people who uh, who will be 100% dedicated to the company. Also, the team shown on the slides need to have uh, the capacity to bring uh, the business uh, to its next uh, fundable point. And. Uh, Last, the last slide is uh, financial. Uh, financial slides, uh, simple and to the point, and most importantly, with a clear goal, reaching uh, eight, uh, um, eighty uh, thousand uh, transactions. Uh, as you can see uh, on example, uh, the only detail that I would uh, I would add here is the use of funds. A rough estimate of uh, where the round is gone. Uh, so now, now I'm going to tell you about some uh, basic rules for presentation for speeches. Uh, the first one, uh, fever letters is the main idea. Uh, when you speak uh, to an investor or at the conference, uh, you are the main source of information. Uh, not the slides. It is important to simply indicate some specific thought. For example, uh, you can support us this way or run to support us. Uh, you don't need uh, a lot of text, graphs, and numbers. It's uh, distracting. Uh, the second one, uh, the idea is uh, confirmed by the picture. Uh, the visual series uh, enriches your presentation with images that assist you in clarifying your message. Uh, and the last one, uh, one slide uh, is one idea. You don't need to, to put uh, whole uh, ideas in only one slide because it will be distracting. So, uh, and uh, we're talking about uh, about uh, some kind of funding, but uh, I'll tell you how to get fun uh, funding from different uh, ways. So, the first one, uh, for example, if you if uh, what should I do if I have an idea but uh, no money? There are many opportunities uh, to find uh, financing at the early stage of the project. Uh, it is important to understand which of them will suit you and uh, what their pros and cons are. The first one is classic uh, crowdfunding. This is a collection of money uh, for the implementation of the project from a large number of small investors interested in your project. There are professional platforms where you can Post the description of the projects and where there's already an audience uh, willing to uh, finance a startup. Uh, for example, in Russia, it's uh, Planet Rule, Boomstarter, or international platform in Indiegogo and uh, Kickstarter, and so on. Uh, one of the successful startups that were placed uh, on Indiegogo, uh, it is possible perhaps uh, to know that uh, Julia Tablet, Julia Tablet. Uh, which scored the necessary amount in a few hours. So uh, the, uh, the next way is obtaining project uh, financing from potential clients. If your main clients are companies uh, and not individuals, try to go for financing from large companies that may be interested in your product or project. It is important to have uh, test samples and uh, a presentation that is well cal calculated from the point of view of uh, finances and uh, feasibility. 
Uh, in those days, such stories are, are commonplace. One such uh, instance uh, is Bill Gates, who started the multi billion dollar uh, renowned company Microsoft, having received funding from MS DOS from IBM even before the bracket was available. Uh, the next way is uh, accelerators. Uh, this is our everything because uh, startup uh, or you know, social significant project accelerators can not only finance but also teach uh, business process, deliver sales, and then present them to late stage investors. Uh, the purpose of the accelerator is to speed up the startup sales period by teaching as uh, the founders uh, to test business uh, hypothesis. I sell and eventually understand uh, whether the idea will take off. And it takes only uh, three or six months plus. Acceleration always have a large circle of partner investors who are ready uh, to pick up projects at more adult stages or stages of financing. And the so last one, uh, and uh, as we uh, uh, told about it, is grant and competitions. And another tool that allows the best of the project to receive funding grants, uh, as a rule, are aimed at uh, accelerating the development of individual indust uh, industries or technological areas. Grant competitions can be held by both state and commercial uh, institutes uh, from large companies, universities, or venture giants. There are also aggregator sites where it's uh, easier to search for information from uh, for any kind of grants. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ekaterina. Okay. That's important information for all our participants. So not just grants can help your projects to get implemented. There are many opportunities to get the financial support. I also uh, would like to add that, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, our world is arranged in such a way that even if you hold a great event, but only a few people know about it, you should understand that you haven't held any event. Therefore, it is important to think about what information resources you use to promote information about your event. Here, of course, we mentioned social networks, your sites, your personal accounts are also important because in many ways uh, you are already opinion leaders. And of course, partner resources, their sites, their accounts, their networks, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, project partners are another powerful resource, not only financial, but also organizational. And now I would like to give the floor to Saad Ouakas, Moroccan, uh, Moroccan global youth engagement and health activist international trainer, TEDx speaker, and Diana Award holder, the GCI 10 Outstanding Young Persons Morocco 2021, who will speak on the power of partnership to enhance project development and implementation. Saad, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'll just uh, ask my other accounts if it can be allowed to share the screen, so it's Sadwaka's screen, so that I can share my slides. And you know, uh, two two years ago in 2019, I was in Slovenia in the International General Assembly of Medical Students Associations, and yeah, I was taking part in the competition of uh, the best uh, projects by medical students. I was a medical student at the time, and then one of our projects won the prize of best medical students uh, projects in the world, and then. Uh, six months after I was in Egypt to get the award of best Arab voluntary project. And what's really special about that project is we went to remote areas to offer uh, free services, health services, social development services for people in remote areas. And our budget was really limited. So how we did that was mainly through partnerships through collaboration with different student organizations, with different agencies, and getting uh, resources from here and there, and we're able to reach that population. So I would like to share some reflections today about the power of partnerships, and I would like to talk about three points. First, about uh, partnership identification and analysis, and then how you would approach a partner, and then finally, how you can make your partnership uh, sustainable. And for sure, when we talk about uh, partnerships, uh, it's any collaboration that you would conduct either with an individual or with an organization in order to support uh, your uh, projects or your work uh, as an organization. So that was 
the idea of partnerships and then uh, first step is identifying and listing your partners you know because for example it's all about identifying two things when you want to identify uh, a partner so it's really important to first identify what you are working on so what is your agenda for example if you're working on gender empowerment or if you're working on climate change or if you're working on uh, migration or vulnerable population or uh, maybe hygiene and sanitation so you have your agenda your cause and then you have your organization so for example if it's situated in a specific city or area or place and then you start listing who are the partners that are interested in this cause for example if you're working on women then you would go to the UN women you would go for example to uh, save the child or you would go to UNFPA or you would go to different national organizations meaning maybe the ministry of women or any uh, NGO that works on women if you're working on climate change you would go to the uh, United Nations environment program or uh, the climate adaptation network or other so you start making your list and then you move on to uh, mapping your your partners and the idea is uh, you make this table and it's called stakeholder mapping uh, table you can find easily in internet and the idea is to find out who are the most powerful partners and organizations and who are the most interested so if we're talking for example about the ministry of environment they are so powerful and then they are so interested to work for example on a local issue that you want to address so they would be you know in this zone here right where you would have to prioritize those people to manage closely and to approach them uh, the first so that's what you want to start with those people who have high influence and then a high power to help you like a local organization maybe local student uh, association who works on gender or on climate they can be very interested but then their power wouldn't be uh, very high so you wouldn't start with those so that's the idea we're making the list because you you have a timeline right you cannot approach everyone so you start with the most powerful and the most interested one and once you do that you try to analyze what's common between you and the partner so for example you see how the partner can help you uh, how you can benefit from them like for example would they give expertise would they give uh, experts would they give resources materials would they give money would they give uh, recommendations or link you with uh, local situation or give you access to the population itself so try to identify how the partner can help you and then also another thing which is the needs of the partners like how can you as an organization yourself help the partner that's very important right it's not only about asking for money or asking for help but to how you can have a mutual relation in the sense of you are giving something back to the partner itself so for example me from my background i was a medical student now i'm a doctor so i'm always say that you know i have the health background i can always link you with health people so it's an added value for me uh, doctors have this uh, social value so you can see you are young people so young people always have this added value of being able to go to the ground to be linked to the uh, you know to the population itself to creativity the energy the social media so you can have a lot of things to offer to the partner so once you figured out what you want to ask from the partner and want to you can give to the partner it's important to figure out how to start the conversation with the partner right because uh, sometimes you know the partner you have some contacts but sometimes you don't have any connections so it's important to know how to start this conversation going so some some ways uh, in which you can start partnerships from the scratch it can be emailing or for example if you are an event so for example this is an event that's happening and you see that we have very influential speakers today that are working in different organizations so you can meet someone in an event message them or email them and get their contacts and start the conversation going from an event so attending events can be a very useful tool networks as well so if you know for example a professor and the professor knows someone from the ministry so your professor can link you with uh, someone and from a partner so your network your people can link you with other partners and then also direct contact so for example if you want to go to the UN office you would go there to their office and you would take an appointment or whatever so those are just some tools that you can use you know to kind of uh, make your partnerships happen so that's when it comes to uh, partnerships uh, creation and then the first thing or the main message that I would like you to keep in mind is that you would need an elevator pitch uh, to convert to communicate with your partner 
because sometimes you are writing an email and it's two page email. This doesn't work. You know, many partners are busy or you are an event and then it's like just you meet the person in a coffee break or waiting in a line or something. So you have less than a minute to make the thing or to make the connection happen. To sell yourself, it's like, you know, it's like you are in a business trying to sell yourself. So for me, uh, your elevator pitch or speech have to contain three main messages. First, how you introduce yourself, who are you? So I am, for example, a young advocate from Morocco and working on youth empowerment and involvement in SDGs or social development. The second one is what are you trying to achieve? What is your vision? What is your project? What is your goal? So for example, I'm working on an initiative to empower 1,000 poor women in my local area to teach them social entrepreneurship to be able to work. One sentence, done. And then the third one is what are you asking for the partner to make that happen, right? So what do you want from them? It's not just about taking a picture with some famous person or just uh, staying in touch, but how can they help you? So this is should be really specific and really concrete. So as an organization which is leading uh, empowerment uh, resources in Morocco, I would love to get in touch and have some experts from the organization join to help our women uh, learn and train. So these are three simple sentences. Who are you? Uh, what are you working on? And then what do you need from the partner? This can be the first thing that you should say. And then you grab the person's attention. And then, of course, you start the conversation and you can exchange contacts. But for those, if you have limited time, your elevator pitch should start with this. And elevator pitch is called by uh, like this because imagine yourself in an elevator with a person and then you only have 20 or 30 seconds before the elevator arrives. So you should be quick. So that's my message for you people. Focus on those three messages so that you can start the conversation. And then once you exchange contacts, you can have a deeper conversation and you start building the partnership. So finally, I will talk about, you know, how to sustain partnerships. And it's really important, you know, because we want to make sure that it's not only one time, but, you know, to stay in touch, to make things official, to keep uh, things on the long term so that you can work together uh, on a long term. So first things, make sure that you have periodic meetings and people try to get busy, right? So it's really important to uh, plan things in advance and be like, okay, each two months, we will have a meeting in the final Saturday or uh, the first Sunday of the week. And we will have, it's just, you know, sometimes checking on each other, keeping the communication going. And then officializing your partnership is very important, right? Sometimes we uh, know someone from the ministry and we collaborate with them on a one or two events, but then there is nothing official written. So it's important to value this partnership, to have a memorandum of understanding, to have uh, official documents written, and then to have something written so that, okay, we are indeed part partners. And so that you can even, even after you finish your position, someone comes after you, you have things documented and things stay sustainable. And finally, identify how you want to communicate. So some people stay want to stay formal. Some people prefer uh, informal communication. Some people prefer in-person meetings. Some people prefer LinkedIn, whatever. So make sure to ask, what are you comfortable communicating with? And then finally, try to reflect on any difficulties or challenges. Do you feel comfortable this way, uncomfortable? Is there anything that, you know, after one year or two years of uh, of uh, collaborations, is there, are there any challenges? And if you can't make it, for example, if you have a challenge, let's say the uh, UN or ministry are giving you money and then you have a challenge keeping up with the timeline, it's really important to communicate that to the partner, saying that, okay, I'm having this and this issue, uh, I apologize for the inconvenience, let's see how we can together try to go beyond and fix this issue. Not like saying, yeah, everything is okay, and then you mess things up and then the partner loses the confidence in you. So it's important to keep honesty. It's important to you know uh, communicate with the partners. And this way, you can make a long-term sustainable relationship. So that's, uh, I guess, my reflections about a partnership. And the main message for me is about a crucial role of partners. They can help you finance your project. They can help you implement your project. They can help you design your projects, evaluate your projects. And uh, one thing I learned during my 10 years of youth expertise is that we cannot do everything alone. I come from a health background, but I'm not an expert in economy or I'm not expert in tech or I'm not expert in social science. So having partnerships, having collaborations with other people who know in their field can help us grow together, work together and go to you know uh, achieve more sustainable projects so that's my message for you focus on building partnerships and working together because our main cause is uh, social development and helping each other so we must do that together and thank you for the attention
Thank you. Thank you, Saad. Uh, the importance of partnership in the frame in the framework of project implementation is unquestionable. Sometimes partners are all. All people need to implement a project without any other resources. But of course, the support should be always mutual. And the last uh, but not the least speaker of our session, Parv Agarwal. He is a business development director of Xinfin Network, director of US-Russia relations at Russian American Youth Alliance and founder of Blockchain for Palestine. It's pretty early in the USA right now, but he is with us and ready to tell us about his experience on pitching startup projects within Eurasian contexts uh, with blockchain examples. Dear Parv, please, the floor is yours. Are you here? Yeah, sure. So, Blagadario, Kira, okay. for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You can hear me? Okay, cool. All right. So, Blagadario, Kira, for the introduction. So, good evening, everyone. Dobri Vitcher, Boa Noit, Namaste, Wan Chang Hao, Sabuboma, Barigisha, Masa Al Khair. I think that covered most of our colleagues. So, my name is Parv, and I'm also a participant in this amazing forum organized by this truly superhuman team. In the interest of time, I won't uh, do a PowerPoint. I'll just discuss verbally. So I wanted to share my experience pitching two different blockchain projects at conferences such as this one, uh, one of which was successful, the other was not. And from both, I'll share with you some lessons learned and some opportunities I discovered which are sort of hidden. So before we get to hidden secrets, let me start from the beginning. So I've been in blockchain since 2018. My first project was designing a blockchain-based recycling system for Moscow as part of my uh, international entrepreneurship class at the Higher School of Economics. We discovered that there wasn't functional recycling in Moscow, not because there was a lack of recycling facilities, but rather even in places where there were recycling bins, Moscow Weiss just didn't trust anything that they put in the bin would end up in, wouldn't also end up in the landfill. So there was essentially a lack of trust in the munip municipal supply chain process which in economical terms is known as informational asymmetry. So as it turns out, blockchain-based supply chain tracking was the perfect solution to this problem. So we came up with a proof of concept design with QR code scanners, where a single piece of recycling item would be issued its own tracking code and this journey through different recycling phases would be visible to the person that dropped the item in the bin. So it sounded great in theory and from a blockchain architecture perspective, it actually wasn't that difficult uh, to implement using Walton chains, but trying to get support for this project, especially in Moscow, was another beast. At the time, unfortunately, uh, none of our team members spoke Russian. We didn't know any local resources, and we were all international students. So we didn't know how to access any local support for this project, and we let it be, though we later discovered that another a uh, local Moscow startup called Uberator developed a similar project and was able to raise $10 million in VC for it and start implementing their solution, which is amazing. So last year I developed, a. Uh, after my master's, I, I gained experience working at central banks uh, and I sort of became obsessed with sanctions and de-dollarization, which led me to trade finance and currency risk. So last year, I developed a proposal to use blockchain and smart contracts to specifically solve the de-dollarization problems within BRICS using uh, chain link oracles that feed into live currency exchanges and uh, autonomous escrow accounts that self-execute. To respect time here, if anyone's interested in the full details, you can read my paper in the BRICS Journal of Economics. Uh, but as we're focused on the pitching part of this, let me elaborate on that. So, Getting my proof of concept published was the easy part. The hard part was trying to get actual support for this, specifically getting the attention of the BRICS Business Council. I reached out to as many contacts as possible, applied for the BRICS Solution Challenge, basically applied everywhere, but ran out of luck and eventually gave up. I later learned that apparently such a project was politically sensitive and there wasn't enough political will for it, unlike sustainable development projects that everyone agrees on. And the fact that I'm a US citizen also didn't help at all. So I gave up on this one as well. Now, my last experience pitching was at the Eurasia Forum in Orenburg, uh, which has been discussed by lots of speaker before. Uh, and I know a lot of you attended because I met a lot of you there. So before the forum, during uh, the May of sort of tragic Israel-Palestine war, I had founded a nonprofit called Blockchain for Palestine, along with a team of developers and subject matter experts 
And we had begun working on an application for a smart wallet microwork solution where people in conflict zones without access to mainstream banking can do small tasks and get paid for it in stable coins and use it for everyday needs within a local merchant network without having to open a bank account. To achieve this, we had partners in major blockchain network called the Celo protocol, as well as partners on the ground in Gaza, Palestine. Now, at the Eurasia Forum, I pitched our project to two different mini competitions, so to speak. The first was the Gorkachev, uh, Gorchakov, sorry, rather, uh, public diplomacy competition. And the second was a pitch round hosted by the Eurasian Business Alliance. Now, the first competition I didn't place in because arguably this didn't align exactly with the public diplomacy focus in the traditional sense. Uh, However, in the unofficial pitch competition from the Eurasian Business Alliance, I had much better luck. I was selected among the five finalist projects for EBA funding. And during the forum in Orenburg, I met the president, VP, and deputy director of the EBA. And they specifically called me to interview with them after their information session. So I presented my deck to them and they asked me a series of questions about my projects, what kind of costs it involved, whether there were any regulatory risks, who our partners were, what sort of development resources we were looking at, how we were structured. Uh, and at the end of the forum, they let me know that they had selected my project as the top choice to fund amongst the finalists. And they were ready with up to 5 million rubles seed investment after I provided them a detailed plan. So after three years of pitching fails, I can finally say I had a successful pitch. So some lessons I learned from this project were First of all, make sure your project fits with the mission of the organization you pitch it to. Uh, as the, the previous speaker, Saad, just mentioned, find uh, an organization that their ethos, their mission aligns with the core of your project. If it's a public diplomacy project, pitch it to Gorchakov. If it's a blockchain project, pitch it to a, a VC fund focused on blockchain. Uh, same thing for sustainable development and so forth. The second lesson is just start designing it and if possible, trying to build something what's known as a minimum viable product, MVP. So a sort of proof of concept for your project, regardless of if you have funding or not. So whatever you can design without funding, whatever you can sort of bootstrap together as this term is known, that's what investors and any kind of supporting organizations are looking for. If you ever watch Shark Tank, you'll notice that those projects that have already started on a shoestring budget and have momentum without funding, they're the ones most likely to grab the attention of investors and VCs. Uh, of course, the, the third lesson is uh, choose your partners carefully. Uh, the previous speaker gave a, a great overview of that. Um, the only thing that I'll add is that it helps to have, um, as he mentioned, complementary skill sets. Um, so if, if, yeah, if you, you are uh, really good into the business strategy, you want someone uh, more into, into development or vice versa. And um, the other thing is to also have partners that have a local context. If there's a particular geography you're trying to tackle, uh, you wanna make sure that your partners are, are based there. And the last lesson is uh, make a clear roadmap for your project. Um, have realistic budgets, and most importantly, consider the risks associated with their project, not only financial and regulatory risk, but also how the supply chain issues that are going on in the world today can affect your timeline. And have in place strategies and buffers in place to reduce those risks. So when investors will see that you've already considered everything short of implementation, they'll be more likely to support you. The key to supporting a project is, do I trust the person pitching the project to know what they're doing? And if anything goes wrong or unplanned, are they knowledgeable enough to quickly figure out how to resolve it? That's what the investors or any supporting organization is looking for. So uh, the, to wrap up, um, and I, I did mention that there would be a, a hidden opportunity. So uh, I will just say this, the Eurasian Business Alliance is still interested in social entrepreneurship project. Um, my project in particular, which was blockchain for social impact, fit right with their mission and something they were focused on, but they're interested in social entrepreneurship overall. So I think most of your projects would definitely fit in there. 
Um, I will definitely send the, the website in the, the group chat right after this. Um, and I will tell you that EBA prefers sort of transparency and if you're going to be working with local populations on the ground, how you're going to do KYC, know your customer, if there's any sort of monetary transaction involved, um, this is a, a regulatory challenge, but there's ways uh, if you do end up going the blockchain route, there's ways to do KYC that are simpler than uh, how traditional banks do it. Uh, if anyone's interested, I can elaborate on that uh, personally. Um, the other thing that helps um, from my interaction with the Eurasian Business Alliance is signing up as a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. So instead of a, a traditional corporate structure, you're decentralized, everything that you do, your company transactions, um, your funds, how you distribute it, it it's based in either crypto or stable coins. Um, and everything is held together by smart contracts. So the nice thing about smart contracts is they're self-executing and there's no risk involved. You set a contract uh, at a fixed maturity from now, there's, if someone lends you, let's say $10,000, you will have to pay them back that plus whatever interest you agreed to. And a, a certain period before it executes, it will have an escrow account. So you will already get those funds uh, in an account that is, is stored until the contact contract executes. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, from a financial perspective, especially in social entrepreneurship, no one's looking for crazy returns. So be realistic with your numbers, with your projections. Um, even if uh, returns are you know far later down the line, that's okay. But but the key is is to show how whatever you're getting funding for will be put to good use. And, and the other thing is to quantify non-tangible returns. So in, in sort of project finance, there's uh, something called cost benefit analysis. And so there's a, a traditional financial model with uh, called discounted cash flow, but there's also something called uh, social cost benefit analysis. So what you do is any, any benefit of your project that's not uh, sort of translating to an immediate return on investment is called an intangible benefit. And you can generally actually quantify those intangible benefits by looking at how much cost you save. Um, let's say you're able to make a process more efficient um, or you're able to, uh, re of course, have a positive impact on the environment. There's, there's definite ways to, to quantify that. Or if it's a, a, a gender empowerment project, what is the, the sort of uh, economic impact? How much wages would increase in, in a, a given community as a result of your initiative? So those are some of the main points I wanted to mention. Um, I just you know wanted to, to, I'm also a participant in this forum. So I'll, I'll put myself also out there as a resource if anyone has any questions. And uh, I will also put the link to the Eurasian Business Alliance in the chat, if that's okay. So, Spasilo. Yeah, thank you, Parv. It was very interesting to know more about your experience. Glad you made it. And uh, now I, th I see that we are completely out of time. So, um, uh, dear participants, if you have questions, uh, you may um, connect me or Akil. Let me uh, put in chat uh, my Instagram account so that you could um, write to me in direct uh, and um, I will address your questions to the speakers. Okay. Um, so from the side of uh, the Russia BRICS project office, I'd like to add that we already have a plan for 2022 and we are very open to including you all in our projects and we'll be very grateful if you consider us as partners for your projects. Thank you very much to all the speakers of this session uh, for such full information on project development. And now all the participants will be divided in, into five small groups, so don't go away. Uh, I now would like to ask the group moderators to turn on their cameras and show themselves to the participants. Uh, let me remind the participants that at 15.30 uh, Moscow time, we are going to have a pitch session where delegates will discuss their projects. 
take feedbacks from experts and improve their projects for final presentations, which will take place tomorrow. So thank you. Um, have all the group moderators turned all on their cameras? No? Maybe you can uh, name you one by one. And uh, we, uh, we will be creating uh, five groups. Uh, from in every group, we will be uh, sending at least one or two people from this uh, uh, moderators so that they could help uh, others uh, uh, during their presentations. So do we have all the group moderators here? Please turn on your cameras so that we could see you. I think, uh, first of all, yeah. Uh, we have already started uh, distribution, uh, so uh, we will check if uh, in every room there is someone from our side. Okay, thank you. See you later. online participants can you hear me if you can hear me please join the groups if you're online and if you can hear me please join the groups you'll see a join sign on your screen
participants who can hear me, please join the groups. Hello guys, uh, I was in room long four, so I'm not that much comfortable with their project. So can I go another room long, please? Hi, can you can you repeat your question, please? Hi, I'm, uh, this is Israt. I was in room number four for the project discussion. So I'm not that much comfortable in that room. So I want to go okay. another room, maybe two or three or maybe one. Thank you. Okay, sure. Please wait.
Uh, hello, everyone. I would like to request you, please join the groups again. If you're unable to join, please let me know. उधर दिख रहा था आपको कौन कौन के स्कूल ग्रुप में
everyone who is in the main group, I would like to request you please join the groups. If you are unable to join the group, please write me in the chat. Once again, can you hear me, guys? I can see here Israel Swankar, Kirill, Natalia, Diana, Sophia. Can you guys hear me? Anyone? Are you here, guys? <laughs> 